Good morning, church. If you guys want to come on in, find a chair. We're excited you guys are here this morning. We're just excited to fellowship, uh, to worship our king. If you'll stand with us if you can, let's worship Jesus. walls that we called sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants we called death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way, but he came, and he died, and he rose, those giants are dead now. This is our God, this is who he is, he loves us, this is our God. That fear that took our breath away Faith so weak that we could barely pray But he heard every word, every whisper And now these altars in the wilderness Tell the story of his
same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God that never late will not throw things out. You're working all things out. And yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. And yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy in all my days. Oh, yes, I will. I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the Choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names, and nothing can stand against. And I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names, and nothing can stand against. And I choose to praise, to glorify.
towards the ground where the grave did. Oh, all my shame left for dead in your their teachers out to the cabin in the woods. <laughs> but along those lines, I also want to let you know we have a nursery space available. So if you need that, by all means, we can take you out towards it. Um, Brett, what's the name of the nurse? What's the name of the building for the nursery? Mount Adams. So there's a little cabin here in the back called Mount Adams. That's our little dedicated space for the nursery. So if you need to use that, by all means, there's a TV in there that live streams the service so you won't miss anything. Uh, over at Gwen's, this Wednesday is actually going to be the last night for a while. Um, yeah, good. that's 
I don't really know how else to word it. This is going to be the last one for a while, especially since as we get closer and closer to the projects that we're going to be focusing on, we're going to take a break there so that Tim can focus. Uh, aside from that, there's the women's conference that's coming up. And today is the last day to register. And so Teresa is, out, is over there in the back where the coffee's at. And if you have any questions or need help with registering, by all means, go talk to her. She will be here for both services. Um, the other thing we have is a baby shower coming up for the Cunningham family. Yeah. And so we're all invited. So please show support as best you can. And um, yeah, wish them congrats when you see them. And then the other thing I have here is offerings. We want to say thank you for your generosity and everything you've given. I think it was last week that we shared the amount that we need to get things going. And we need, at least right now, 1.8 million. It's a big number, but God has been incredibly faithful in providing the property for free. That was, a, I think it was a $6 million property, and God just gave it to us. And so we know he's able to do amazing, wonderful things. And so please pray, and, and however you're able to support, we greatly appreciate it. The website's back up and running, so if you give through the website, you can. Um, there's that, there's the app, there's the black box. And again, just thank you. Thank you for everything. And that's all I have. So I'm going to pass it off to Tim. All right. Thank you, Caesar. Everyone say thanks to Caesar. Thanks, Caesar. Uh, here's the thing. Caesar, are you, are you a junior or senior? Junior. Junior, you guess. Yeah, your transfer stuff's weird. Yeah. Um, so do you only have one more semester after this one? Three. But only a few classes, actually. Okay. Yeah, so you can be praying for Caesar. He, he's uh, in the midst of finals. That's why he said he's so tired. And uh, yeah, I could go back through and correct a whole bunch of those announcements, but I won't. <laughs> I understand. Uh, that's why I was laughing over here. Uh, that was good. Um, hey, just a, a few things. Yeah, with uh, Wednesday night, um, we, we are taking a break <laughs> until the fall. Uh, there's new owners that will be uh, taking over Gwen starting the first week of May. And uh, they're, they're just a little bit overwhelmed trying to step into Mallory and Sherry's shoes. And uh, it's not only, you know, the Gwen's running a coffee shop there, but also catering business. And we were one of many groups that they just let use the building at different times. But, um, you know, I, I, I get it. The new owners are feeling overwhelmed and need to back everything up to just learning the coffee shop and the catering and stuff. And so that's why we're breaking for a few months um, totally get that. When we got our church property, there were different people renting and using the properties, and that was a little bit difficult for us to step into immediately and uh, try to, you know, field all of that. So totally get it with them, and uh, part of me is saying, you know, oh, that's nice. I get a break on Wednesday nights for a few months. But when we get into our new building in the fall, we'll start Wednesday nights back up at that time. So excited about that. Uh, yeah. I like you guys today. This is, every pastor fears that, uh, you know, in church, you're going to have people sitting over here that are like the two old crusty guys on the Muppets, you know, <laughs> but that's not, you guys, you two are just like, woo, I like that. I like that. And on that note, let's pray. Lord, I love you so much. And uh, just thank you for the opportunities we have here today. Thank you for uh, giving us this space. Just how awesome that for the last, you know, two and a half years, we've been able to be in this space and just be able to uh, draw closer to you, meet new people, and uh, Lord, just to see your church grow. God, thank you for the things that you have done over the last several years. God, I, I praise you for what's happening right now, and, and Lord, just feel like in so many ways you are taking us and, and you are stretching us and helping us to learn to trust you with every aspect of our lives. And, and thank you for that opportunity. Thank you for showing up again and again and again. And Lord, uh, this is the, my prayer, that you would just move in such incredible ways today, that for the people that are about to come, that we would be able to uh, see a home built for them within this church, 
a group of people that are warm, inviting, and just point to you. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. Lord, we love you. We trust you. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, amen. amen. Um, you know, maybe just a side note, but I, I'm just curious, when we worship, how many of you look at this screen and how many of you look at that screen? I'm just curious. It, it, point at the screen you, you look at. I'm just curious. Yeah, it's, it's really funny because we've had this screen up here for uh, several weeks now, and I realized uh, today I constantly just look at that screen, and I looked over and I was like, oh, there's words behind them? Isn't that incredible? Uh, I guess we just get kind of stuck in our ways sometimes, but uh, yeah, pretty, pretty incredible that there's stuff behind us. Hey, I'm excited to be here, and uh, our goal as a church is just to know God more and to make Him known to more people. And uh, I, I've just personally been enjoying our time in Genesis. The whole reason we are going verse by verse, chapter by chapter through the book of Genesis is just because we want to know God more. It's the first book of the Bible, and the whole point is God telling His people, this is who I am, and you can trust me. And for me personally, and I know a lot of people I've been talking with, that's what we're experiencing in this church, getting to know God more, uh, be able to trust Him more, and just the experience of seeing more people come to know Him. And it's just an incredible thing. I'm trusting today that as we look at Genesis chapter 17, that that's what He's going to do, just take us a little bit further down that path to knowing Him more. And uh, I'm going to go ahead, and this is the game plan for today. I'm going to read all the way through Genesis chapter 17, and then we'll back up and talk about different sections of it. But so you know, the things uh, that we want to look at today, three different words, and uh, if you're taking notes, you can write these words down, and as I read through, maybe you can highlight uh, where these things come up for you. But we're going to look at covenants, names, and walks, okay? Covenants, names, and walks. This is what we read in Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, behold, my covenant is with you. You shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all of the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money, from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your household and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant." 
And God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, No, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father twelve princes, and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. And when he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael his son. All of those born in his house were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day, as God had said to him. Abraham was 99 years old when he, circumcised, when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael his son was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised, and all the men of his house, those born in the house and those bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. This uh, passage that I'm preaching on uh, today uh, with my preaching calendar that I had, um, you know, it was actually supposed to be my teaching from last Wednesday. And uh, if you remember, if you were here last week, I went ahead and I repeated uh, the teaching I did in Genesis 16 um, uh, last week here, which put things behind. I, I originally wanted to preach this passage on Wednesday night uh, because Wednesday night is all adults. Uh, second service, this is going to be very interesting because there's uh, several uh, teenagers that come to second service and sit with their parents. And I can just see what's going to happen as they start asking about circumcision and foreskins. Um, but with that, uh, Dad, if you could come to second service and answer questions at the end, I would love that. Um, oh, yeah. All right. Man, this passage is one that is just full of incredible information and so many different things that we could talk about. And really, that's how the book of Genesis goes over and over again. But like I said, there's three things we want to focus in on. And the first one is the covenant. This is the beginning of a covenant for Abraham's family. And that covenant is sealed with circumcision, an outward sign of the covenant that God is making with his people, okay? It's an outward sign of a covenant God is making with His people. And it's something that's important throughout the rest of the Bible, a topic that comes up over and over and over again. When you get to the next book of the Bible in Exodus, what you find is the story of Moses. And, you know, you, you read about the first 40 years of Moses' life, how he grew up in Egypt... He tries to set his people free from slavery, murder somebody, and then for the next 40 years of Moses' life, he goes from being an Egyptian, some type of uh, royalty or in uh, the, the Pharaoh's household, all the way down to being a shepherd in Midian, which is huge. Because what we learn from the Pentateuch is that to the Egyptians, shepherds were the lowest of the low, and they could not eat with each other even. They could not eat in the, in the presence of each other. So Moses goes from here for the first 40 years of his life down to here for the next 40 years of his life. 
Moses is called by God at the age of 80 while he's in front of the burning bush to go and set the people of God free by confronting Pharaoh. And as Moses goes to do that, Moses wasn't circumcised. Moses' sons won't circumc- weren't circumcised. And this covenant is so important to God that it be sealed and there be a physical representation of it that an angel of death is there to kill Moses and his two sons unless Zipporah circumcises them. That's how serious this is. It is an outward sign of a commitment that God has made to the family of Abraham. And what you find is just throughout uh, the, the Old Testament, this teaching that goes on about circumcision and, and God's people when they are turning to Him and, and when they are committed to Him, there is that outward sign that takes place. It's supposed to be done when a child is young, but it didn't always happen that way. So there are times where it has to happen where people are older and they're the ones making that decision. I will now follow God and so I will be circumcised, an outward sign of a covenant that God made with His people. What we find, though, is that um, there are two errors that take place with the idea of circumcision, this outward sign. One error is that God's people did not take the sign seriously. So it was sort of a, a take it or leave it by some of them. They culturally would follow God, yeah, we're God's people, and and take in the blessings of God. But they didn't do this one thing that God asked. So on one hand, they didn't take the outward sign seriously, and therefore it's a take it or leave it. On the other hand, sometimes they took it too seriously. And they thought that it was this outward sign that, that like made God love me. It was this outward sign that, that gave me the blessings of God. And because that outward symbol was there, somehow I am closer to God than you are. And there was a pride within some of them because of this. It's something that we see over and over again in the Old Testament, even with the sacrificial system, the sacrifices that God's people were supposed to bring, and they thought that by doing these outward works, which they were told to do, that those were the things in and of themselves that made them uh, favorable to God, that made them get the blessings of God. But what you find throughout the prophets in the Old Testament is that while God did command an outward sign of a covenant in circumcision, what He really wanted is a circumcision of their heart. That inside, in their heart, they would be saying, God, I I am trusting you by faith. I'm walking in faith. I'm here with you. And yes, I'm doing this outward sign, but it's not magical in any way. It's it's about my faith in you. And Lord, I love you and I praise you for the things you've done for my people in the past, the things you are going to do right here in this generation. We even find with the, the outward labor of the sacrifices that it wasn't just the sacrifices God wanted. What He wanted was a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. And these were the things that God would not despise. I think it's important for us to realize this because we have a covenant today in the church with God, and that's a covenant of salvation. This right here that we're reading about with Abraham is a covenant of salvation that there would be a Savior that would come through this line, but more so it was a covenant of multiplication, that He would bless His family and expand it and multiply it. But we have a blood covenant of salvation with Jesus Christ. We have sacraments or ordinances that we do. Um, baptism is one of them. And it is too easy for us today to fall into the same errors that the Jewish people fell in. One, 
to not take baptism seriously. We are told to be baptized. The Great Commission, go therefore into all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded, and I will be with you always to the very ends of the age. On the day of Pentecost, when the church started, Peter's preaching to a crowd in Jerusalem, and they're convicted, and they, they want to give their hearts and their lives to God. They, they are putting their faith in Jesus Christ. And they look at Peter, and they say, what do we need to do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of the, your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. This gift is for you, for your children, and for all those who are far off. Baptism is something today that is a sign of our faith in Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, in many circles, it's not taken seriously. It's sort of a, a give or take, if you will. But what you see in the New Testament over and over and over again is a seriousness about it. When they put their faith in Jesus Christ, what was the next step? Baptism. And it wasn't, hey, let's put it on the calendar for, uh, you know, next fall when uh, my relatives from Iowa are here so that they can be a part of it. It was, no, I'm putting my faith in Jesus Christ. Let's do it. Let's do it now. To the point where even in Acts, it gets to the point where they're like, in fact, there's a puddle right there. Let's go get in that mud puddle in the desert and, and I'll roll around in it and that's baptizing, right? That's incredible. So there is a seriousness about this symbol, this sign. There is something very real that takes place on a spiritual level when it comes to the symbol of this covenant. And yet, I also think we need to be warned because just like in the Old Testament and in Judaism today, there can be people that have done a sign or a symbol of a covenant but not take it seriously. Baptism can happen the same way. Man, um, let me be real with you. When am I not real with you, <laughs> right? I have a love-hate relationship with baptizing people. I have a love-hate relationship. I get so excited when uh, people get baptized. I think it's incredible to see people on fire for the Lord. But at the same time, this is my experience as a pastor. Sometimes I baptize somebody and afterwards I wonder, was that real? Are, are, are they, they really doing this for the right reason? Are they really putting their faith in God? I, I mean, they're saying all the right things, but I cannot see into their heart or what's going on. They're really just doing it because their fiance's family are all Christians and they want to be accepted. Or, or because uh, they just think, hey, this is a good thing to do. I, I show up at, at a church and I, I see people that are well connected and, and you know, it, to get ahead in life, it's about who you know, so I'm going to join this group and I'll go through the baptism. Or for people that I know today. And I talk to them and you look at it and they're like, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. You are. Yeah. Oh. When did you get baptized? Oh, I got, I got baptized a long time ago. I'm a Christian. And yet, there's no evidence in their life that that's the case whatsoever. I see that a lot of times. Other things we do that are outward signs. There's, there is something about communion where the Lord is present with us as we do this. But how easy it is for us to take these symbols right here and not approach them in a way that is glorifying and honorable to the Lord that takes it seriously. We have this incredible covenant of salvation with the Lord that if you confess with your mouth Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We do these different things Brothers and sisters, let's make sure we never fall into the trap that so many people do. 
to either neglect baptism and communion, but also not to think that simply by taking communion, I can just go ahead and live my life however I want, and God is just smiling on me because I took communion. You look at this, and and this is an incredible blessing that has been given to Abraham and his family. He has already been told once as he entered the land, Abraham, your children are going to be like the dust. They're going to be like the dust. Can you count all all of the little little pieces of dust or or the, the sand on a beach? Can you count that, Abraham? That's what your family will be like. In the previous chapter, he's told, look up at the stars. Abraham, look up. You see all those stars up there? Your offspring's going to be like that. What we see in the previous chapter, though, is Abraham took things into his own hands with his wife, Sarah. She was old. She didn't think she could have children. So she took her servant, Hagar, not related to Sammy, and gave her to Abraham to sleep with her. And Sarah said, Get my servant pregnant, and that will be my child of this blessing. They went sideways with God's plan. But in this chapter, we see again the covenant given, and it's it's sealed with circumcision, but God goes further in what He says, and He lets Abraham know it's going to be through your wife, even though she is 90 years old. She will be the one to bear you a child. I could go on more about the covenants and look at covenants throughout the Bible, but we don't have time for it, so let's move on to the names. This is an awesome chapter where there's so many things happening with names. As a preacher teacher, I'm excited for this because for weeks now, you've heard me stumble every time I say Abram or read the name Abram, I want to say Abraham right? And from here on out, I can just say Abraham, and I won't have to stutter anymore. I'm I'm excited about this. It's amazing because this is a place where we begin to understand the seriousness of names in the Bible and the fact that God, in a lot of places, renames people and gives them a new identity. He renames them and gives them a new identity. You look at it, and it's awesome that Abram goes to Abraham. Abram means exalted father. Abraham means father of a multitude. Both names are cool, right? I mean, that's great. Uh, That would be awesome. How many of you would love it if God changed your name? How many of you men, uh, you know, to exalted father? How many of you like that? Wouldn't you like it if your kids called you that, right? Hello, exalted father. Um, That's great. But the cry of Abram's heart is to have a family. And so now God is saying, you are no longer exalted father. I am renaming you, and your new identity is father of a multitude. Father of a multitude. And Abram's reactions are so interesting to this covenant God is making with them. Abraham hears this part, and he falls on his face. He begins to worship the Lord as he hears this. I'm going to be the father of a multitude? Oh, my Lord, praise you. I want to worship you. Have you ever been in a place where God blesses you in such a way where there's just flat out a physical reaction that takes place? Whether you just fall to your knees, you you have to sit down, whether the, the tears just start coming, that is one of the most incredible things that God does. And when He blesses you in a way where it's something that's weighed heavy on you and you've prayed about and you prayed about and you prayed about, and all of a sudden you find out the Lord is doing this thing, oh, what a natural reaction it is to fall on your face before Him and just worship Him. Say, Lord, thank you. I'm yours. But then did you catch what happens? His posture changes. He hears 
you're going to be Abram, the father of a multitude. And he's on his face, worshiping. And then God says, and by the way, it's all going to happen through your 90-year-old wife, and you're going to call her Sarah from now on. And he goes from on the floor worshiping to on the floor rolling laughing. Did you catch that? God tells him what he's going to do. God's like, this is how I'm going to do it, Abraham. And he's rolling on the floor laughing. He's like, ha, ah, that's a good one. That's a good one. I'm 99. She's 90. <laughs> that's a good one, Lord. And he begins to laugh at God. You know what I think is amazing in this story? Is that a lightning bolt didn't fall from heaven right at that moment? <laughs> right? That's just, a, it's amazing. The, the grace and the mercy and the patience. And you even look at this in the previous chapter. In the previous chapter. They didn't trust the Lord's plans. They said, God said Abram's going to have a son. Mm, it's not going to happen in any sort of supernatural, miraculous way. So let's do it in a way that is dishonoring to him. Clearly, the ends justify the means in this case. They didn't trust the Lord. They didn't trust the Lord and his promises. Now God is telling them exactly how it's going to happen, and his first reaction is to start to laugh at God. God's been patient this whole time. Uh, you know, uh, when, when Abraham and Sarah came up with their plan, and, and they brought in uh, Hagar, the servant girl, and forced her into this situation, um, God you know, didn't say, you know what, you messed up, and now I'm taking away my promises. No, because these were promises given by God that were everlasting, right? Right? So he patiently and faithfully worked with them. And then Abraham's like, Lord, I already have a son, Ishmael. He's right here. Instead of, you know, giving me another son, can't we just stick with this one? I mean, I, I understand you have your plan, Lord, but can we just stick with the plan I created? That's basically what he's saying in this. Stick with the plan I created. <laughs> Aren't we just crazy the way we do that with the Lord? It's not just crazy. We look at the promises of God and what He says in His Word, and we are constantly trying to do it ourselves, the way we think it should be done, and in our timing. And even when the Lord makes it incredibly, incredibly clear what He wants, we laugh at Him, we doubt Him, we try to stick with our plans. I mean, I guess it's somewhat natural for us. I, I, I have trouble looking at that screen instead of that screen, right? Because I'm so used to this over here that I have trouble changing here. The way I live, the rhythm of my life, the way I do things, I, I, I'm just, I know I'm going to run that new four-way stop on uh, Redwood and Territorial. I know it. I grew up on that street. I'm going to end up running it. As soon as those, those signs are, are not there, and uh, I apologize when I do it when it's, I'm cutting you off, right? Because uh, inevitably, that's the way my life works. It'll be someone from church that I, you know, that's just the way that works. We get stuck in our ways, and we have so much trouble believing what the Lord says and what His Word is. And this is just such an incredible example of God's patience. Names. I said, we'll look at names. We have Isaac, we have Sarah, we have Abram. But there's a name in here we can't miss. It's the first time this name appears in the Bible. And it's in verse 1, when Abram was 99 years old, and the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. We just learned a new name of God right there that has not appeared in Genesis. The name is El Shaddai. El Shaddai. And it means God Almighty. This is God saying, I am the Almighty. 
I'm not just like the God who is confined to the ocean. I'm not the God that's confined to, to the field or to the mountain. I'm not the God who's confined to the moon or the sun. I am the God that is outside of all this, and I am more powerful than all this. I am omnipotent. Isn't that awesome? I love thinking about the the almightiness of God, the fact that He is all-powerful, that He is omnipotent, and there's nothing He can't do. We started out our study in Genesis. He spoke creation into existence. I can't even get my dog to go to the bathroom when I command him to, right? And yet God spoke all of this into existence. Let there be light, and there was light incredible. His beauty, His glory that's all over the place in His creation. Wow. He's the God who parts seas, who makes water come from rocks, who provided manna in the desert, who dropped fire from heaven to burn up sacrifices. He's the God who calm seas, and walked on water. He is God Almighty. But here's the thing about that name. In Genesis, every single time El Shaddai comes up, it is addressing the fact that God is going to take His people and multiply them and bless them. I always think of God Almighty in these phenomenal cosmic ways, right? I just, that's the way I think about it. But in Genesis, it is always about God being all powerful to bless and multiply his people. How many of you remember the old song from the 80s? Uh, How many of you were live in the 80s? All right. I can rephrase that. How many old people do we have in that? That's right. All of our younger people are like, those are the old people. you guys remember the song, El Shaddai, El Shaddai, Eliana, Adonai, right? I'm like, because every time in the Bible, El Shaddai is about blessing and multiplying. In my head, I've been singing it all week, El Shaddai, El Shaddai, uh, or no, El Shaddai, multiply, bless your people, Adonai. That's like what's been going on in my head all week, and I was like driving my wife crazy with that. Um, just stuck in there, but do you catch that? He is almighty, but he is not impersonal. He is almighty, and yet he is here, and he is multiplying and blessing his people. Brothers and sisters, that is what he wants to do today in his people. And I'm not talking about a health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. There are definitely hard times we go through as people. And, and, you know, as a culture and a nation, we are sliding into a time that's going to be very hard for Christians. But in the midst of all of that, he is creating a family for himself. Just like he created this family for Abram, he's creating a family for himself. And he is saying to us today, I am the Almighty. And I'm going to take my family and I'm going to bless them and I'm going to multiply them. That's exactly what we've been seeing as a church over the last few years. Blessing upon blessing upon blessing, multiplication upon multiplication upon multiplication. And that is his character. The third word I want to focus on, walk. He says, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. Walk before me and be blameless. Now, that word blameless there does not mean sinless, as in you never do anything wrong. It means that your walk is solely focused on me. You're walking in my rhythm, in my direction, at my pace. It's not about perfection. It's about direction. And I love this idea of walking. Walking has the idea that when you start walking, you're not staying in the same place. There is movement happening, right? 
I, I look at that, and that is what God is calling us to in His church today, to walk with Him. How do I know that? Uh, a lot of different passages in, in the New Testament, but let me just grab this one here, Ephesians 5, starting at verse 1, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love. How are we supposed to walk? In love. In love all right? Remember that. If our walk with the Lord is not completely drenched in love, it's not walking with the Lord, all right? We're not walking in anger. We're not walking in division and dissension. We're not walking in a way where we're hurling insults and pointing at people. We are walking in love and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice. How are we to address other people? Sacrificially, like Christ did. Uh, this is kind of weird, but just bear with me here. It's, it's what Paul said, not me. We're supposed to be a fragrant offering. It shouldn't be that anyone ever thinks Christians stink. We admit a foul odor, like a stinky cheese. No. We should be the most beautiful smelling people in our community. That when we walk into a room, the fragrance of the sacrifice of Christ is right there. The gospel just enters right in with us. You ever been in a room where uh, somebody walks in and, and their perfume just overpowers the whole room? fills it up in a good way. That's how we're supposed to be, okay? In a good way. He goes on, he says, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness nor foolish talk nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving, for you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or covetous, which is idolatry, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. You can drop down to verse 15 of Ephesians 5. And again, he says this, look carefully then how you walk. Not as wise, but as not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk on wine, with leads to debauchery, debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus, and submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's what we're called to walk in. God has given us a covenant of salvation. He's the one that paid the price. We don't walk in order to get the salvation. We walk with Him because we are saved. And he says, this is what this walk looks like. Walk with me. It's not going to be perfect, but are we headed in the same direction? Are you moving at my pace and my rhythm and I'll work with you and, and by my spirit teach you along the way? And do you realize this? Just as Abram has a new name, if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, you have a new name and a new identity. Your identity is wrapped up with him, and you already have a new name. I'm not Tim. You're not Kara. You're not Ron. You're not Sinjin. You want to know how I know that? Because Jesus Christ in Revelation said this, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Your Lord already has a new name for you. 
and a new identity. And someday, you will stand before him. The way I picture it in my mind is he's going to say, hey, everyone else out of the throne room. Everyone else out of the throne room. Davis, get up here. And he's going to hand me this white stone. And on it will be my name, my true name. And he will say, this is who you are. This is who I created and called you to be. By my spirit and by my word, you've overcome. Take it and now come and enter your rest. Yeah, with that, Lord, that's all we can say is amen. Father, thank you for your incredible patience. Just like Abram, we struggle with your covenant. We struggle with the things you say to us. And and so often we doubt and we try to do things in our own power and in our own way. Thank you for your patience with us. That You patiently teach us that uh, our way is not the right way. Help us to trust you more today with the things you have said. Lord, for all of us in our lives, we get so tired of just trying. So help us to try something new, and that would be trusting. Help our faith in you today to be at least the size of a mustard seed. And God, help us to understand that as we walk with you, that there is grace in that, that it's not about perfection, it's about direction. Help us to hear the rhythm and the tempo of your walk. And to this week, have the joy of walking right alongside you, feeling your touch on us. And Father, thank you for the hope we have that we have a new identity in you, a new name that is only known by you. Thank you for what you've done for us on the cross. We love you, we praise you, and we pray all this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said. Elements of communion up front and back. Brothers and sisters, let's close out this time just in worship to him and thank him for what he's doing in our lives. Will you stand?
may not face Goliath, but I've got my own giants. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. Now I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your children now you are the same God you are the same God you answered prayers back then and you will answer now you are the same God you are the same God you were providing then you are providing you are the same God. You are. Yeah. You moved in power. Then. God moved in power now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You were a healer. Then. You are a healer now. You are the same. We have a good king. Have a good week. We'll see you next week.